So he is the current MINDET chairman and the former, uh, former secretary of the Department of Agriculture. He is a Mindanaoan who is a seasoned print and broadcast journalist who served as close-in writer of President Fidel Ramos in 1992. He served as municipal mayor of Mlang in 1995 to 1998, North Cotabato governor in 1998 to 2007, and Cotabato vice governor in 2007 to 2010. Secretary Pinol is best remembered for the following accomplishments. Simplify, a simplified governance, a system that identifies the basic needs of the communities in the town of Mlang through WLRLP or Water, Light, Roads, Livelihood, and Peace. The bottom-up agricultural planning program he, he initiated used the priority crops approach in North Cotabato focusing on four major crops. Okay. Uh, Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, once again, let us all welcome our Secretary, Emmanuel F. Pinol. Thank you. Pinahinto ko na dahil masyadong mahaba. Basing mas taas pang introduction ka sa speech. Um, my greetings to uh, Cardinal Orlando Quevedo. Uh, you know, I, I was in the seminary. I was in the seminary. I was one of uh, the junior Oblates of Mary Immaculate Seminarians at NDU. And I'm proud of it because the seminary actually uh, molded me into what I am today. The good things, of course. No? Yung mga sama, hindi kasama yun. No? Yung maganda lang, yung mabuti lang. Kasi baka sabihin ni uh, Cardinal Quevedo, yung masamang ginawa mo, hindi kasama yun. No? So, doon lang ako sa mabuti. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, the Chancellor of uh, the Mindanao State University, Dr. Anshari Ali. And thank you for the book, Doctor. I will read this. Uh, the President of uh, PIBS, Dr. Celia Reyes, uh, the representative of uh, Mayor uh, Ronald Rivera, the uh, OIC president of uh, the University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, Dr. Rosalito Quirino, Dr. Rolando Etzanova, president of uh, the Sultan Quadrat University, State University, Dr. Fidelinda Tawagon, president of Danzalan College Foundation, Dr. Ruth Lucero, President of Southern Philippines Agribusiness and Marine and Aquatic School of Technology. Dr. Samson, are you here? Oh. Dr. Samson Mulao. Hola. Oh. President of uh, Cotabato Foundation College of Science and Technology. Uh, of course, we also would like to uh, acknowledge our partners in this uh, undertaking. The UNDP, represented by Winston Camarinas, who is from my hometown, from Lang. Uh, Robilyn uh, Diaz of uh, ASA Philippines Foundation. Director Dennis Librado, Tribal Leaders Development Foundation. And of course, uh, earlier I, I uh, paid my respects to uh, uh, my Cardinal Orlando Quevedo of the Mindanao River Basin. My dear friends, I am 65 years old. I was born in an era when uh, we sent, we expressed our sentiments, our affection by, uh, by air mail. I was born in an age when uh, messages were sent by Telegrams, PTNT, uh, RCPI. I was born in an era when uh, being able to travel to the United States of America was a big deal. It was published in the, uh, in the Manila Bulletin, going to the U.S. 
That was the period when I was born. Luckily for me, from that age, I was able to witness the transition to a new technology. This is the so-called information technology. Today, when you say, I love you to a girl, you don't have to send an airmail or a telegram. You only send a text. Kita kids. Eyeball. Mag-eyeball tayo. Sa Starbucks. Wherever. So, modern information technology has created what used to be a very big and wide world into a smaller community. And with the transformation of the big, wide world into a smaller community, we become one small family. And it brought about the advent of globalization. Modern information technology has made it easier for us to know what's, what's needed in the U.S. market, what's needed in the European market, what's available in Papua New Guinea, what price, what is the price of crabs in Papua New Guinea, lobster. Information technology has made all of this possible. Information technology has also allowed us to order online. Alibaba, Lazada. This is modern information technology. And this is part of globalization. But there is something in globalization that we must all be aware of. It is a double-edged sword. If you are prepared for globalization, you will benefit from it. If you are not prepared, woo to you and to your people. And this is actually what is happening right now with the controversial rice tarification. I hope that uh, there are no media people around to document my statement because I don't want to be quoted publicly. May na ba mga media dre? Patiyano sa na inyong kwan? Now I'd like I'd like to I'd like to share with you my sentiments on this matter, and I would like to tell you the true story behind this. I hope. Mula ba media? Asa pekas pa? Di ba dongog? Di ba dongog? Okay. You know. Alam ko na controversial ito, especially ang dito yung PIDS, no? because I know their mindset. No? Gusto ko lang ipaliwanag ito. And this was one of the reasons why I told the President, Sir, I want to leave. Mine was a voice in the wilderness. As early as 2016, we already prepared what we call the Rice Roadmap. It was based on the inputs of farmers that we talked to and we talked with in a meeting, in a forum at UPLB. In that forum, we invited 10 of the most outstanding rice farmers all over the country. And the 10 of them shared with us their stories. One of them was from Bansalan, Davao del Sur, and he was harvesting eight metric tons per hectare, while the national average at that time was only 3.9 metric tons per hectare per harvest. Another from Ilui Ilo was harvesting 15 metric tons. That was the highest. So when, when they shared with us their stories, we found common denominators. And all of this pointed to the fact that the Philippines, if only we decide to invest in agriculture, specifically rice farming, could be rice sufficient. Dito ako kinakansyawan ni Presidente, kasi ilonggo daw ako, sinabi ko daw na maging rice sufficient ng Pilipinas, hindi naman nangyari. Ang problema kasi hindi naman nabigyan ng pondo. But look, here is the computation. At that time, our rice shortage was only about 800,000 to 1 million metric tons per year. At that time, the average harvest per hectare was 3.9. But as emphasized by the outstanding rice farmers, production could be increased 
by implementing five simple measures. One, all of the outstanding rice farmers said they were using good quality seeds, hybrid and inbred. That's one. Number two, all of those rice farmers said they had sufficient water for irrigation. That's two. Alam nyo, let me tell you about this. There are three important elements in agriculture. One is sunlight, because without sunlight, there will be no photosynthesis. The flowers won't bloom, the trees won't bear fruits. Number two, you have to have soil as the anchor. But both these, sunlight and soil, could be substituted. Pwede kang gumamit ng artificial light, pwede kang gumamit ng hydroponics, eliminating soil in the planting. But the third factor that you need in agriculture, which does not have any substitute, is water. Tell me of an agriculture without water. Sige nga, uh, pare pareho naman tayo may PhD dito. Sabihin nyo nga sa akin, kwentuhan nyo ako, papano kayo makapagtanim kung walang tubig? Especially rice. Number four, the farmer said they were using modern machineries or machinery. Wala palang prulad yung machinery. Okay. Number five, they had access to capital. May pera siya, may pang finance. So that at any given time, they could provide inputs. So based on this, we came up with a proposal. We proposed a 60 billion budget over the next three years, targeting only six metric tons average per hectare. Why were we so confident that we would hit the target? Because it was done by the 10 most outstanding farmers. They were harvesting from 8 to 15 metric tons using that same formula. And we even had a conservative target. Six metric tons lang, wag na tayong mag ng walo. Because we have 4.9 million hectares of rice farms harvested every year. If only we could increase our yield by two metric tons per hectare per harvest, that would be 9.8 million metric tons of rice. Sobra-sobra na yun. I-divide mo by two. That's about 4 million metric tons of milled rice that you will have. So theoretically, it was attainable. Ang problema, just like in any business, agriculture needs investments. You need water. You need good seeds. You need fertilizer. You need machinery. You need capital. And this was what was absent in that program. Yet in spite of that, in 2017, the Philippines recorded its highest harvest in rice production, 19.28 million metric tons. That is the highest in the history of the whole country. Ang problema, nagkaroon ng artificial shortage in 2018. I say artificial because when you say rice shortage, may pera kang pambili, wala kang mabiling bigas. At that time, may bigas na mabibili, pero mahal. So I would call that an artificial rice shortage. And saan nagmula yun? It started when the NFA, because there are two bodies in the NFA. The NFA, the agency, and the NFA council, which is the supervisory council, headed at that time by the cabinet secretary. In September of last year, it was transferred to the DA. Hindi sila magkasundo kung mag import ba o hindi. They started arguing October of 2017. Umabot na ng April, hindi pa sila nakapag-import. And you have to understand that every year, meron tayong tinatawag na lean months. Ito yung buwan na hindi tayo nag-harvest. And that is the time the imported rice is supposed to come in to fill up the shortage in the market. Without the NFA rice in the market, the traders saw this as an opportunity to manipulate the price. Kaya tumaas yung presyo. Ngayon, nung tumaas ang presyo, nagbilihan din ng mataas na palay. Tumaas din ang presyo ng palay and the farmers enjoyed it. But at the end of the day, 
it contributed to an increase in the inflation numbers. And so as a reaction, the economic managers proposed the lifting of any barrier on the entry of imported rice by proposing the rice tarification law, which actually, in actuality, was really a rice, rice liberalization law. Magkaiba po yung rice tarification sa rice liberalization. Yung sinasabi nila na wala tayong magawa kasi commitment sa WTO, no. Wrong. Wrong. We were not committed to the, w, the WTO to lift all trade barriers on rice. Kailangan mo lang itarify. Allow the entry of imported rice to come in, pero itarify mo lang. Okay? So, at that time, when they were proposing this, my view was, okay man yan, kasi tingin ko patas lang. Kung nanghihingi tayo ng access sa ating mga produkto to markets, markets abroad, we should also allow the produce of other countries to access our market. That's fair. But at that time, my dear friends, our farmers, even until today, our farmers are still not ready for the championship rumble. Parang boxing to eh. Yung kalaban natin, Vietnam, Thailand, are supported by their governments. Merong mga hidden subsidies. In fact, they even have an agency which handles their rice exports. Vietnam, for example, has their Vina food. Yun ang nagninegotiate kung saan mag-export. Suportado sila ng kanilang gobyerno. Dito sa atin, the farmers are left on their own. Bahala ka kung saan mo ibibenta. Maglaku ka ng gusto. Kung gusto mo, ilagay mo sa basket mo yung uh, kamatis mo at ilaku mo sa palengke. And this has always been the failure of this government. Not just this administration, but even previous administrations. We have failed to empower our farmers. We have failed to capacitate our farmers and elevate them to the level of a processor and marketer of this product. For so long, he has remained just that, the producer of raw materials for the market. Therefore, he is dependent on the middleman and the processor who buys his produce. Tingnan nyo yung copra. Hanggang ngayon, tayo ang number two sa buong mundo sa copra. Pero hanggang ngayon, copra pa rin ang pinuproduce ng ating mga magsasaka. So what happened? Pagbagsak ng coconut oil price sa world market, sad-sad ang ating mga coconut farmers. Thailand only has 216,000 hectares of coconut. Philippines has 3.5 million hectares of coconut. We are number two in the world, but Thailand is number one in selling high-value coconut products because they capacitated their farmers. They elevated their farmers from the status of just being a raw material producer to a processor and marketer of this product. So today, Thailand is even buying from the Philippines to process. Tayo yung kawawa eh. Ka, mo nang hangtog ka ron, tiglong ka lang gihapon o kopras ang atong mga mag-uuma. Naka-short pants, gisi-gisi, o sinina, o niya, tiglong ka lang kopras. Ingnan ni mo nga, Pwede nyo balidya, buko ba? Buko-buko ka ng buwanga ka, ang among problema ko, pras, presyo. No? Kasabaan pa ka. No? They will even get mad at you if you suggest to them to shift to other high-value products. Now we are trying to talk to BARM to allow BARM farmers to export mature coconuts. Meron tayong batas kasi na nagbabawal na mag-export ng mature coconuts. Sabi nila, Baka kumalat ng genetics ng coconut natin. Walang hiya in this modern age. Even just one, one chunk of a coconut using tissue culture, you could already develop a genetic material. Ang totoong purpose niyan, monopolize kasi nung araw ng mga oligarchs, yung coconut industry. So they did not want the raw materials to be shipped out of the country in raw form. They wanted to buy it because they wanted to control the price. That's the truth of the matter, my dear friends. And this was during the time when globalization was yet an alien word to all of us. So going back to the rice program, noong pinag-uusapan yung rice tarification, ang sabi ko, pwede man yan, i-liberalize natin pero dahan-dahan, 
phase liberalization. We should empower our farmers first. Because just like in boxing, you cannot expect your boxer to put up a good fight against a world champion if he is only an amateur fighter picked up from the streets to fight in a championship fight. You cannot do that. You will kill your boxer. Therefore, what you need to do is train your boxer, give him vitamins, feed him well, inject him with whatever that would make him strong before you pit him up against the world champion. So what happened to our rice farmers today is similar to the story. They are raw fighters, unassisted by government for so long, weak, incapacitated, barely empowered, and we are putting them up in a fight against the world champions from Vietnam and Thailand. Ang sinasabi ko noon, i-deliver muna natin yung intervention. Pataasin muna natin yung ating production bago natin buksan tuluyan yung merkado. Because I believe the Filipino farmer could compete if he only he is supported by government. Make him strong, empower him, improve his productivity to the point that the cost of production would go down. Because every time you increase your production, the cost of production will go down. Kung kasi yun eh, ibig sabihin, ngayon, 12 pesos ang estimated cost of production per kilo. Why? Because our average is only 4 metric tons. But if you double that, your cost of production will go down to 6 pesos. Because you put, you put in the same amount. But you only need to use good seeds, more irrigation, effective fertilization, mechanization. You could double your harvest. Okay? So what happened here is this. The problem now, yung projection na kapag binaha mo ng bigas sa merkado, babagsak yung presyo, pwede yung theory na yon sa kamatis. Or is that? Because these are perishable items. If you flood the market with tomatoes today, the tomato vendor will be forced to sell his tomato at a lower price because tomorrow it will be rotten. Not rice. Because rice can be hoarded. Rice can be kept for six months. And in rice, there are big traders involved, and they could talk to one another. And they have been talking to one another. They could control the price. So what happened now? Why are we in such a mess? It is because our local farmers have been denied the market. The importers now are making a lot of money from importing rice. The landed cost of imported rice right now is about 23 pesos per kilo. The selling price on the market is 40 to 50 pesos per kilo. Ang tinutubo nila pinakamababa, 10 piso isang kilo. Sinong trader ang loko-loko na hindi sasanay dyan? So now, nobody would like to buy the local rice anymore because the margin of profit is very thin. And the risks are high. You have to dry it, you have to mill it, you have to keep it in your warehouse. Whereas if I import the rice, I only have to put up a notice, hey, I have a coming shipment of uh, 1,000 metric tons at this price. I talk to some traders, why are you not buying? I ask them, why are you not buying? Sabi nila, sir, maski bibili kami ng 1,700, and that would be about 34 pesos per kilo. Pwedeng ibagsak ng importer yung kanilang bigas, 1,500. Lalabanan kami. Patay din kami, hindi namin may benta. So right now, nobody is buying. Right now in Cagayan Valley, I think it's 8 to 10 pesos. Sa amin samlang, nasa 12. Down from 20 pesos. Yet, take a look at the price of rice in the market. Still the same. Compared to the 2017 level, wag 2018. Kasi mataas yung level in 2018. But if you compare the price of rice in the market today, to the 2017 level, it's almost the same, even higher. Why? Because right now, na box out yung mga local farmers, and the local traders aren't buying. The problem with this is, I believe, the interventions being offered by government right now are off target. So you give the farmer 15,000 pesos in assistance, good. You give him good seeds, good. You give him fertilizer, good. But that is not the problem. The problem is, where will he sell his produce when he harvests? 
You want the LGUs to buy the rice? Ha! You are courting disaster. The LGUs do not have the competency to handle rice trading. Number two, it's such a difficult trade that you need to be an expert in determining moisture content. You have to have a warehouse. You will court disaster. COA will run after you. And the next thing you know, you will be hailed to the ombudsman for graft and corruption. A simple reduction in moisture content will get you into trouble. So my dear friends, this is the, the, the situation that we are in today. You know, I traveled two hours to be told that I only have five minutes left. <laughs> Give me justice. And that's why many people rebel because they don't get justice. Okay. I woke up very early today. I would have left my farm very early were it not for early morning visitors. But I apologize for coming in late. Uh, but I think you should give me one more minute. Anyway, this is the picture today. But it is not that bleak or dire. Again, globalization, if you know how to use it, could cut an edge for you. What am I talking about here? Last week, I was in Papua New Guinea. I talked to the Prime Minister, I talked to the uh, governors of uh, two provinces. Papua New Guinea is a net importer of rice. And I told them, hey, would you like to buy rice from us? We have the best rice. We could produce the best rice for you. Premium rice. And they said, okay, we buy rice from you. Because the Australians have been supplying them with rice, telling the Papua New Guineans that they could not plant rice, when in fact, Papua New Guinea is one of the two countries in the world with the most number of wild rice varieties. Okay? So, Sabiko, you know how much the price of rice in uh, Papua New Guinea is? It's about 100 pesos per kilo. But they are not revolting. Dito, tumaas lang ng 60, nag-wild na yung mga tao. So, this is the way out of this mess today. We use globalization to our advantage. We will reach out to markets which are interested in acquiring and buying good quality rice from Mindanao initially. The U.S., Hong Kong, there is a cooperative in Mlang called Don Bosco Multipurpose Cooperative. They've been selling organic rice, Middle East, Hong Kong, Germany, even, uh, even the Middle East. Kagabi ng meeting kami. So they will lead, they will lead the advocacy to tweak our rice industry in Mindanao by producing high-value premium rice instead of the ordinary rice para ang mangyayari, sige, mag-import kayo ng mumurahing bigas from Vietnam na may pakapin na Agent Orange uh, na chemicals, bahala ka sa buhay nyo. At kami naman sa Mindanao, tayo sa Mindanao, we will produce high-value quality rice, we will produce organic rice, and we will hit the niche market of health conscious buyers. My dear friends, what I just told you today is a simple story of globalization, its advantages and disadvantages. So what are the lessons to be learned here? Number one, for us to survive globalization, especially Mindanao, we have to capacitate our stakeholders, especially in the area of agriculture. We have to adopt modern technology. We have to prepare them. We have to organize them. We have to empower them. This is the only way we could benefit from globalization. Because unless we do that, we will get the raw end of globalization. But also, if we are able to take advantage of this, Mindanao could be the front door of this country and no longer the back door. We are the only area in this country which is not hit by typhoons as often as northern Luzon. This is our distinct advantage. Our soil is more fertile than that of Luzon. So these are the, uh, you know, these are the things that we need to balance. As I've said, while I, when I was asked to talk about globalization, I wanted to, to you know, to relate to you stories that you could, you could easily uh, identify with or link with. 
In fact, sinabi ko nga kay sa aming staff ngayon sa Minda, sabi ko, maganding ginagawa natin sa Minda ng mga advocacies. But I hope and I pray that our advocacies would transcend the four corners of conferences, conference rooms like this and make these advocacies felt by the people and make these advocacies change the lives of our people. After all, this is what advocacies are supposed to be. So my dear friends, I think I have reached the limit of uh, my um, uh, statement, or my, my message. Uh, I hope I delivered a, a um, coherent message in spite of the fact that I have not prepared a speech. Uh, I hope that uh, you understood what I meant. Let me repeat. Globalization is both a boon and a bane. It all depends on how you play it. Thank you very much. Daghang salamat, Secretary. So we apologize for the time reminder, but we appreciate um, you for sharing us the perspective of how the world changed from uh, telegrams to SMS and for reminding everyone in this room that our farmers are in fact capable. It is just a matter of formulating the correct intervention and uh, to help them tap the potentials. Dakang salamat, sir. And at this point, may we request our guest, Secretary Pinol, to be joined by ASEC and uh, Chancellor and Dr. Celia for a photo opportunity. This will be followed by our keynote uh, participants and our discussants. Also to be joined by our university presidents, vice chancellors, and Cardinal Quevedo. Okay, we are, please join our Vice Chancellors, Cardinal Quevedo, our University Presidents, and uh, our Speakers. Dito na po tayo lahat sa taas, sir, and ma'am. Okay, so we are finally ready to proceed with our session, uh, with our first session. But before that, I would like to remind our 
speakers that you will be given 20 minutes for your presentation and 15 minutes for our discussions. So our speakers will be given a signal when it's already